has already been given they're giving their nice tutorials during the during the last uh, during the first two days or the tutorial days of the workshop. So um, today he will be speaking on uh, quantum measurement uncertainty. Thank you for the introduction and thanks again for the opportunity to give this talk as I was able to give the tutorials and start with a reminder for those who were there at the tutorials what I did there and in doing so I tell those who weren't there what they missed. Um, I gave a brief history of the problem of measurement uncertainty relations and an illustration in terms of qubits for the example of qubits of rigorous formulations of measurement uncertainty relations. Today I'll pick that up, I'll briefly present those um, relations. In the tutorial I, the aim was to show you how this material can nowadays be taught in a, in a beginner's quantum mechanics class if you like. So here I'm just um, summarizing these results and the aim today is to compare these results with those of a competitor program which claimed to have violated Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So I'll explain exactly what that meant and why I think that is wrong, that claim is wrong. And curiously, that approach led to experimental tests which successfully confirmed those violations, alleged violations of Heisenberg. And again, I'll tell you what that means and why it isn't what it seems. And by lucky coincidence, we were able to use these tests to also see that they already test the relations that we formulated later. So there's a lucky overlap between the two approaches on a kind of singular case, but looking more closely at that overlap, uh, we find also significant discrepancies which shed some new light on that alternative approach. So that's the program for today. Um, I dedicate my talks on the subject this year to my mentor, teacher and mentor Peter Mittenscher who passed away in November and the dedication is also because he constantly reminded us of Heisenberg's concern about measurement uncertainty in a way it was, it remained for Heisenberg unfinished business that this hadn't been formalized as precisely as uh, preparation uncertainty had and that had entered, as you all know, the textbook literature so that's the lineage from Middlesbrough to Heisenberg, as far as this problem goes. And then the third person here appears because you could paraphrase the underlying problem as the problem of giving a version of uh, error measures, root mean square error measures that apply to quantum measurements. And that's not entirely a trivial task. I'll give you two competitor proposals, our own, and one by Ozawa and co. And then I leave it to, uh, to yourselves to judge which one you might consider or not consider acceptable. So that's the program. I'll remind you of there being two sides, two faces to the uncertainty principle, which I capture with the terms preparation uncertainty and measurement uncertainty. Um, in order to formalize precisely what we mean by measurement uncertainty, we have to look at Concept, formulate the concept of joint measurements of non-commuting quantities and approximate joint measurements of sharp non-commuting quantities. And that then prepares us for the task of giving quantitative measures of error and disturbance. And that enables us to write down measurement uncertainty relations in particular, and I'll do that here for qubits. And that is where I compare the two approaches that I'll be presenting you on uh, quantifying measurement error. So, back to Heisenberg 1927. What I uh, take out of the paper, I'm not going to give you the history in detail here, just say what I read out of it, and at least a few people along with me read out of that. Well, probably everybody agrees that Heisenberg nicely <coughs> encapsulates the essence, essential aspects of the quantum mechanical worldview in those two terms, quantum uncertainty and, well, he didn't use the term Heisenberg effect, but measurement disturbance, uncontrolled disturbance due to measurements. 
quantum uncertainty, well, that captures the, the limitations to what can be known about the physical world according to quantum mechanics. And Heisenberg was the first, and I guess, to write this in terms of an uncertainty relation in a rather vague form. He doesn't precisely define what he takes as a measure of error or uncertainty, and he doesn't precisely define it at all this twiddle sign, but this is a symbolic relation he gives. And we know how to make that precise, but in fact this isn't done by Heisenberg, this was done by subsequently in, in increasing degrees of generality by Kennett, Robertson, Weil uh, and Schrödinger. So that is textbook wisdom and that is what I call preparation uncertainty. This concerns properties of the quantum state as we can test them by measuring either position, take the statistics of that, or take a similar ensemble separately, then measure momentum. This has nothing to do with joint measurements. And often people say it's nothing to do with measurements. So preparation uncertainty, well, yeah, they are tested by doing measurements, of course, but they are separate measurements. And textbook writers who are careful point that out quite clearly. Others are not so clear and um, conflated with measurement uncertainty. And that doesn't make much sense. <coughs> anyway, the Heisenberg effect, the the fact that any measurement principally disturbs the object through what Heisenberg sometimes refers to as an uncontrollable state change. And um, that gives rise to the statement also that uh, operationally we test this by finding that measurements disturb each other. Making one measurement and then another one after that uh, has the effect that the second measurement doesn't see the undisturbed quantum state anymore. So effectively that means something else is measured, some distorted observable of what we intended to measure. So the presence of another measurement in between has a disturbing effect. And that's what we capture with the term incompatibility. And accordingly Heisenberg says things that you can read as, uh, in the four, as, as statements like this here, that there is a trade-off between the errors of the Q measurement and the P measurement, or there is a trade-off between the error of a Q measurement and the disturbance that has on measuring P subsequently. So those are the measurement uncertainty relations, well, that's the form of measurement uncertainty relation, and these have remained vague un up until the 1990s. So that was the history I gave in my tutorials. There is some challenge to Heisenberg, as I said, and Mozawa, Michael Hall is in that, and a few other people. Um, they wrote a relation that looks like an error trade of relation. I've yet to give you the definition of epsilon here. That signifies a form of measurement error, proposed form of measurement error. And then generalizing from position or momentum, it looks like one should expect a relation like this to hold. There are three question marks there because mathematically this is incorrect. Um, with Ozawa's definitions, this becomes correct if you make the assumption that the approximations are unbiased. They reproduce the first moments of the target distributions of A and B. Under that assumption, this is a correct inequality. There's a curiosity to that. Usually, unbiasedness is to be taken as a feature of a good approximation. You have removed systematic errors. And you have to do that, go to that level of good approximation, to then say that it's supposedly a bound to the accuracy. It's kind of curious. The explanation to that, I didn't want to go into much, too much detail, is that underlying this inequality is one that concerns the unsharpness of the approximators being used in a joint measurement of A and B. These approximators, being good approximations of non-commuting sharp observables, have to be non-commuting them themselves, and the epsilons really are the, the, the degrees of unsharpness of these approximators. So this is not a measurement error relation, but rather an unsharpness relation at the bottom of it. That's in a nutshell the correction to Ozawa. The second correction is to say Heisenberg never wrote a relation of that generality and he certainly didn't try to prove it. 
as some authors to suggest. So there is a challenge made to Heisenberg that, uh, yeah, well, it's not, not really Heisenberg's responsibility. So I propose, and that refers to the title of my talk, not to bear with trying to read Heisenberg's thoughts posthumously, but maybe um, invoke his spirit, or really say, better to say, try to find out what measurement limits are there are according to quantum mechanics, if any. And Heisenberg's spirit would be captured, I would say, if you end up proving a rela formulating and proving a relation of the form here, that the combined joint measurement errors for two observables, incompatible observables, the errors have to be bounded uh, by the incompatibility of A and B. So that's what I'm going to spell out for qubits here, mostly. So in order to decide whether such statements can be proven, we certainly need a precise notion of approximate measurement, approximate joint measurement, and measures of approximation error, measures of disturbance, if you like. So this is just to document the challenges that have been made. Violation of Heisenberg's measurement disturbance relationship. This is just one example of a paper where that claim appears. Uh, here is another, and there are many others. These have appeared in the, well, since 2012, and the claim is still being perpetuated. But historically, I think this is not quite appropriate. And um, in addition, it turns out the experiments that have been performed, ironically, do confirm uh, our error relations for qubits, which are rather confirmations of Heisenberg's ideas. So, on then to formalizing the approximate joint measurements. Joint measurements to begin with of quantities that are not commuting, and then on to using those to, to, as approximators to some sharp non-commuting observers. And sharp non-commuting observers, we know since von Neumann's proof, are incompatible and not jointly measurable. So here's my favorite caricature of a measurement scheme, preparation, measurement, registration, counting statistics, checking probabilities that the theory provides, that leads us to the concept of a PVM, a set of positive operators called effects that add to the identity. So I can be quick on this, I suppose, because that should be widely known. We can go on to refine descriptions of measurements, in particular take into account that state changes by using the concept of instrument and describing measurements as dynamical processes in quantum mechanics by using measurement schemes where you have an apparatus Hilbert space, an apparatus initial state, a unitary coupling operator, and a pointer observable on your apparatus to define the statistics and um, infer what you are measuring on the object. So that's all I want to say about this. So this concept of an observable as a POVM ensures that um, yeah, an observable physical quantity is really characterized by its statistics, that, that statement or that, that view. So, Imagine you are given a black box and the claim is this measures position. How would you find out? Well, you throw in position eigenstates and if you confirm there are outcomes with certainty that correspond to the values of these eigenvalues, then you would accept that as a position measurement. So you calibrate your device and see if it behaves correctly by using enough states to, to test it on. And of course that means if two devices behave Identically, they give the same statistics, they define the same observable. So that's an identification of the signal. And that means that for approximate measurements, we would expect similarity of the statistics. And this is what we want to quantify as measures of error. As I said, unbiasedness can play a role. In a biased, an unbiased approximation is one where the approximating observable C um, has the same first moment in each state, so the first moment operator is defined in this way, with the positive operators weighted by the values, the outcomes, uh, coincides with the target observable. 
that is often taken as the only criterion for a good measurement, but um, that won't be good enough in general. So, in this probabilistic spirit, we say that two observables are jointly measurable, and I'm here doing it just with a view to the qubit case. Two outcome observables with values, say, plus and minus one, are jointly measurable if there is a joint observable, so that there are four effects where G++, or KL, uh, indicates the event of the occurrence, simultaneous occurrence of an outcome K for C and an outcome L for D. So there is that individual level. We have individual measurement outcomes. We get two of them in, in such a joint measurement scheme. One signifying firing of the event, uh, indicating a particular value for C, and one outcome indicating an outcome for D. And we have joint outcomes then represented by those effects G, K, L. We reproduce the statistics of C and D by taking partial sums, or as we call them, marginal observables. And that's the requirement for a joint measurement. So, as I mentioned for Neumann's theorem, that generalizes to the statement that if at least one of those two observables is sharp, C or D, then joint measurability can only be given if the observables commute. And that opens the door for positive thinking. If you allow them both to be unsharp, then you can have joint measurability. And that's what I'm going to show you shortly. Uh, incidentally, that's another reminder that Mittelstadt very forcefully repeated and impressed on us. <coughs> Heisenberg's thinking about uncertainty was actually quite positive. Um, we usually learn the uncertainty relation for preparations as a negative statement, as a constraint, as a limitation. And it sure is that. But it was much more important for Heisenberg to see that error relations give a limit, but they also say if you respect that limit, then there is a, posi a positive possibility of measuring position and momentum jointly. And this was much needed at the time to understand, in view of the incompatibility of position and momentum, how joint values could be observed as, for example, in bubble or cloud chamber tracks at the time. So to understand the phenomenon of well-defined trajectories of elementary particles, Heisenberg's concern was to establish that as a positive possibility in line with quantum mechanics. So there is some positive thinking going on here. And in fact, um, constructing joint observables, say, of three spin components can be done and you get a device a single measuring device that is informationally complete, if you do it right, that is suitable for state tomography, that has full information about the quantum state. So there are new things that you can do. A single measuring device, get information for, about the full state, which you couldn't do by just measuring standard observables. So here's our concept of approximate joint measurement then. We need, well, we have target observables that we suppose do not commute. They are sharp, they are incompatible. We have compatible, we, we, we ask for compatible observables C and D, so that C approximates A, D approximates B, and of course being compatible then means there is a joint observable for those. So that's my concept of approximate joint measurement or joint approximate measurement of A and B. A joint measurement of C and D serving as an approximate joint measurement of A and B. So as I said repeatedly, we need to find suitable measures of approximation error. And just let me remark, the problem of defining disturbance measures reduces to that of defining error measures. Because disturbance is operationalized, as I said, by first measuring, say, C. Then you say you want to make an approximate or sharp measurement of position follow that by measurement of momentum. As a result, you will see that in, with a view to the initial state, your momentum measurement is rather disturbed, rather distorted. And you can compare the statistics of a sharp reference measurement of momentum to the actual statistic you get after the position measurement or the momentum variable. And the difference is an approximation error. So that sequence, first position, then momentum, serves as a joint measurement of position and momentum in an approximate way. 
and the approximation <coughs> errors that I'm going to define also serve as measures of disturbance in that case. So disturbance conceptually is not really much adding much, it can be reduced to joint variability. So then on to that. I will distinguish or propose or present, discuss two approaches here. One is what that I call value comparison, another that I call distribution comparison. Um, at the bottom of it, Osama's approach is concerned with value comparisons, ours with distribution comparisons. So the idea is very much more classical, uh, classical reasoning in Osama's case. You try to measure, use a sharp, a good reference measurement of your target observable, simultaneously apply that to the same object each time with your new measurement to be calibrated. So you do get two values out in each run and you take the mean deviation between those values for statistics. That's the idea for value comparison. Distribution comparison is much more modest. You have a standard device that gives you the distributions for your target observable and a very good approximation. And your new device is being tested, calibrated against that by comparing the statistics. So there are two separate runs of experiments. This is, it's clear that the latter procedure can always be applied, as long as you have a good reference measurement. The first procedure presupposes that the observables, the, the standard, the target observable, and the approximate observable are jointly measurable. And that may not be good enough when the task is to find simultaneous approximations for non-commuting quantities. I'll give you an example of that too. So, from the outset, value comparison seems to be of limited applicability in quantum mechanics. Nevertheless, let's follow that route. So, our target observable A is A, C is an, some approximate observable, and um, the protocol is to measure them both jointly on each system of an ensemble, and take this quantity here, delta, as a delta squared as a squared measure of deviation. And because you are assuming to begin with that A and C are commuting, these are joint probabilities proper, and this is an operational quantity that you can measure. So that's Ozawa's, if you take the root, um, proposal of a root mean squarer. In 1991, he's very careful in a paper there to spell out the conditions under which this makes operational sense, as I described it now. Well, later on he wanted to find universal, general measurement uncertainty relations, but he realized that those approximations may not be enough, those that commute with the target. So, he observes, of course, that this quantity can be written without reference to the joint statistics, just involving C alone, and A alone, well there's a square of course here, so there's some trickery there, but you don't really need the joint statistics to evaluate that, and so you can then, once you've written the, the delta squared in this form, you can actually forget about, <coughs> uh, you can forget about the requirement of commutativity. So that, there's a generalization going on, drop the assumption of commutativity. So that's a formal generalization, quantity that can in principle be measured and the experiments that test Ozawa's relations set about measuring these by applying different methods. So, well, our provisors are certainly value deviation doesn't make any sense anymore once you do that, once you drop the commutativity of A and C. In addition, you can, we have a lot of Examples constructed a lot of examples where you kind of stretch, stress the utility of this epsilon quantity. Well, I'm talking here about measurement noise. I'll say in a moment why. So that's my term for this, to distinguish it from measurement error. So I'm distancing myself from that interpretation now in this generalization. Measurement noise is a more neutral term in my ears at least. And... Um, it is possible, well, let me put it this way, if 
you want, if you're desperate to construct the ultimate measurement, and you have decided you have chosen a, an error measure, then your criterion will be to set the measurement up such that, well, this is state dependent for a given state that you're interested in, your error tells you this measurement is perfect by having value zero. So epsilon equal to zero should mean perfect measurement. Well, if A and C do not commute, you can nevertheless construct measurement scheme C that do not commute with A and produce error zero in Ozawa's sense. Although, yeah, they don't commute, the statistics are vastly different. I have an example where C has, is a three outcome observable, A a two outcome observable, and there's no obvious match between them. And I don't know what it should mean to say that that is a good approximation. So curious things happen if you stretch the definition beyond its original limits. And it gets worse than that. Well, if it can. Yeah, yeah, let's go on step by step. So here's the original way Ozawa took on the concept of root mean square error. It looks very suggestive. This is in the context of a measurement scheme where your object is in state rho, your probe is in state sigma, in the Heisenberg picture description, your pointer observable evolves in time and then it's compared to the observable um, that you want to approximate. And you take the difference, square that, and take the expectation. And the root of that is Ozawa's root mean square error. Well, this quantity was introduced in quantum optics to describe amplification noise. And I suppose in the models of interest, the amplified signal and the target signal, input signal, would commute, and all this does make good sense. You really get the correlations between your output and input, and that is exactly what you want to optimize. But carrying this over into measurement theory and then calling it a measurement error has its problems. So these are alternative ways of writing Ozawa's measurement noise quantity. The first term here, C, the second moment of the C measure minus the square of the first moment and the expectation thereof, that is a measure of unsharpness in the sense that it describes the deviation of C, of C from any projection value measure. It describes how much C fails to be projection value. And indeed, this quantity is zero for all states row exactly when C is projection value. And then in addition, there's this term that looks like you're really comparing the first moments, but that is maybe also, that is indeed misleading. Um, because if C1, or if C and A do not commute, then C1 minus A will be incompatible with C1 and with A. And declaring that the difference operator has any relation to the two components with which it doesn't commute is almost the same uh, conceptual error as you would commit if you teach your students to measure the value of the energy in a single run experiment by measuring the potential energy and the kinetic energy separately and add the values. This just doesn't make sense. Our separateness, that word is uh, misleading here. We should aim to measure these simultaneously, and we full well know we can't do that. We can't offer to do this. And here's a similar difficulty. So, this is at the bottom of the construction of examples, non commuting examples, where epsilon can get zero, although the observables are vastly different. And there's no, good, no sense in which the approximation would be good. Now, let's bear with Ozawa and Rancière's refinement, Ozawa's inequality that corrects the allegedly wrong Heisenberg inequality. Well, the inequality that is wrong, if taken generally, but is not Heisenberg's. Uh, anyway, Ozawa fixes the error in that inequality and gets a correct inequality here, which has a couple of terms. The product of errors, of noises, and then these additional terms which involve the standard deviations of A and B. And that all taken together is bounded by the commutator term. It's clear that now you have the freedom to construct measurements where 
even one of the errors here might be zero, and then this, yeah, and still this inequality can be can be satisfied or will be satisfied. So that's what Ozawa and Co. see as a violation of Heisenberg to make this product term small. Okay, here's Rancière's improvement, a relation that for pure states actually becomes tight as he proves. So that has yeah, a squared form. It's sort of a transition from convexity arguments to arguments involving quadratic forms that gives this nice um, relation. It's a very ingenious proof, very beautiful mathematics. And yet, as we shall see, fraught with riddles. I'll get back to that. So now we have the possibility to have small products of measurement noises. As I said, Bronsiar's inequality is known to be tight, but our claim, and we elaborated that in a Reviews of Modern Physics article in great detail, these are not purely error trade of relations. We have to be very cautious with them. So, where are we? Here's a simple example to indicate that. As a measurement scheme, we take two identical objects, one the ob systems, one the object, one the probe, probe and state sigma, the coupling is a swap map, the pointer is identical to our target observable A. Then the measured observable is A, and if we measure B afterwards, the disturbed observable is actually a trivial observable. It always gives the distribution of B in the state sigma, because the states have been swapped, the original system is now in the fixed state sigma. There's no information about the initial state in any subsequent measurement. This is a maximal form of disturbance where nothing is left of information about any other observable. <coughs> then, well, the disturbance for B becomes, uh, looks like this here. There's independent contributions from the state rho, from the state sigma, and a systematic deviation, if there is one. So, well, uh, in a nutshell, the, the point that I want to make is even if rho is taken to be sigma, you get eta non-zero, root 2 times delta of B sigma or delta of rho sigma, uh, B rho, the, the, the standard deviation of the distribution of B and sigma or rho then are identical. So the disturbance isn't zero in this sense, although if I choose rho equal to sigma, it swaps into sigma. The system hasn't changed state, and yet this disturbance quantity says there's a disturbance. So something is quite strange with this quantity. Now on to distribution comparison, and I'll throw at you a particular error measure here for comparison, because my claim is we can formulate an alternative um, root mean square error concept, and that is in terms of the so-called Wasserstein alpha or Wasserstein 2 distance of probability measures. In a nutshell, here's the definition. The two distributions we want to compare are the distribution of C in row and of A in row. Um, given those two distributions, we can ask for the set of all joint distributions that have these as marginals. It's a mathematical consideration, it's mathematical processing that we are performing here. They may not have any physical interpretation, but mathematically we can form this quantity for any such gamma. And then we get rid of gamma by taking the infimum overall gamma that have that property of having those distributions as their marginal. And that defines a metric <coughs> under the space of distributions. So there is a distance of these two distributions for each state. And then the Wasserstein alpha, that's the Wasserstein alpha distance of probability distributions. It has the nice feature, important for position and momentum and its uncertainty relation, of scaling with the scale on the value space. So that's one motivation for it. And it also, well, if you, if you put alpha equal to 2, then, then this is properly, that, that deserves the, the name, I think, of um, root mean square deviation. So, we get a distance of observables by taking the supremum over all states here, so the worst possible case over all states. 
That's the measure of similarity length of C and A. I'm not working much with this today, just to show you there is an alternative to that, and that's properly workable in quantum. So, on to qubits, standard stuff here, Pauli matrices, states and block sphere representation, positive operator, or posit operators in general in block sphere representation, effects would have positive eigenvalues adding to, well, not adding to one, but the effects that we use for observables then would add, have effects that add to one. And here are our target observables, some sharp observables in, well, corresponding to, yeah, block vectors in the direction of A and B, and approximate observables C and D, which have additional factors here in front of the identity, and then also block vectors C and D, positivity of the, uh, of the P of M's, guaranteed by those relations here for the parameters. I call symmetric a pair of an observable C if the gamma factor is zero, because then the C plus and C minus have the same coefficient in front of the identity operator here. And sharpness comes about if we take gamma equal to zero and the length of the C vector one. So a measure of unsharpness would be given by the root of one minus C squared. For this, in, in the search of compatible approximations, it turns out that the optimal case is found among symmetric POVMs. So we can focus on these. And for those, we know exactly when they are compatible, and that is when this geometric relation holds. There's a neat interpretation for that in terms of unsharpness. This is equivalent to saying that the product of the squared unsharpness measures of C and D is bounded by the non-commutativity of C and D. So that's another variant of unsharpness relation that wasn't anticipated in Heisenberg's work, but that comes up naturally if you start formalizing joint measurability of, of non-commuting quantities that are then made compatible by adding enough unsharpness or noise in them. So that's step one. We have a notion of, we have realizations potentially, this is the condition that we have to satisfy and it's easy to satisfy. Um, of jointly measurable qubit observables, and we can use those to approximate incompatible observables A and B. <coughs> now, as a variation of the theme, I choose not the Wasserstein distance to begin with, but something slightly simpler, if you like, namely probabilistic distance, or the so-called uh, total variation distance of the probability measures. And if you go through that, let me be quick. You get something that does really represent a metric on the four-dimensional expansion of the block sphere. And for our symmetric approximators, when we put C0 equal to zero, this first term even vanishes and we just have the Euclidean metric on the block sphere as our measure of error, which is kind of neat. It's really, yeah, and if you like, if you ask me to do instead the Wasserstein distance, I can do that and work that out. And you find it's not proportional, but it's squares proportional to our probabilistic distance. So it is <coughs> as good as an error measure as the probabilistic dis uh, distance, or vice versa. So now on to Ozawa's concept. We can cast that here and, and work it out. For symmetric approximators, it has this form, 1 minus c squared plus the distance squared. So that means, compared to the probabilistic distance, epsilon is double counting contributions from unsharpness, which is yeah, causing a can of worms, as it turns out. But I didn't mention that I had a line which I skimmed over. Ozawa's concept is expressly state dependent and they make a big point of that as opposed to our measure which is global which gives worst case estimates for errors. Our measure characterizes the performance of measuring devices overall irrespective of what state you feed in. This measure supposedly quantifies errors in a much more refined way at the level of single states. Now in the qubit case that doesn't make any difference because you see for those particular approximators, there is no state, in, the state dependence left. 
So that virtue is gone. Um, and as I said already, epsilon may actually be zero for suitably chosen and bad enough approximators that do not commute with A. So that's the warning. Grancia actually notices this and says, that, well, this is kind of an artifact of the definition, and he goes on to do his thing, uh, not worrying too much about it. And um, we, we think it's a, fa a fatal flaw, in fact. So here's the fulfillment of our scheme. We, sorry, we know what joint measurements are. We know what approximation errors are. And the goal now is to optimize the errors simultaneously. The answer is this. If you have an error point diagram, each point corresponds to coordinates dBDA <coughs> of admissible errors. They are realizable by some joint measurement if the point is somewhere in this blue region. So there is a convex boundary line here. And as a quick uncertainty relation, one could de describe this red line here, which touches at the symmetric point. And the answer is given here. The constraint of compatibility leads to the error bound, which is the sum of the errors being bounded below by the incompatibility of A and B. So that's the precise statement that I have promised and that I deduced in my tutorials. And here that picture shows if A and B are not orthogonal, then the optimal approximators C and D are not aligned with A and B, and that means they are not commuting with A and B. So optimal approximations generally requires non-commuting approximators, non -co not commuting with the targets. So uh, we can generalize this and describe the full error boundary curve that I had in this blue diagram. If A and B are perpendicular, then that becomes a circular constraint. And that is where the miracle happens. In Bronciard's refinement of Ozawa's inequality adapted to this case, he gets this wonderful quartic curve here. And if you do a simple rescaling, making it, adapting it to the similarity this measure had with, with our measure, you see that that becomes a circular condition, just of the same form as ours. And sure enough, if we take our optimizing approximators in that case, in the orthogonal case for A and B, C and D have to be aligned with A and B, then that works for Grand CR2 when it gets down to this boundary line. So that is equivalent to our circular boundary line in this reparametrization. So that looks good. You may wonder why is there stuff up here? Um, is there a boundary here? Well, that is due to the fact that we have constrained the approximators to those symmetric PVMs. If we allow the approximators to be trivial observables, then we can fill the upper bits of this diagram. And what, what matters is really here the, the boundedness away from zero errors for both components. So that's the interesting bit here. So in this overlapping case, there, there are common optimizers for Grancia's optimization problem and ours. But then it actually gets really bad for Grancia. It has additional optimizers. And you see that if you rewrite Grancia's inequality in this form, this term here turns into 1 minus c squared plus 1 minus d squared plus a cross C squared plus B cross D squared. Now, A and B being perpendicular, <coughs> you can choose C and D equal to be M, a unit vector. In that case, this becomes sine squared of an angle and cos squared of an angle. This quantity is always 1. C squared plus D squared, well, 1 minus C squared is 0, 1 minus D squared is 0, so you have 1 equals 1. That is an optimizer. But in terms of the picture, that means any point on the circumference, even opposite to A and B, is considered an equally good approximation in terms of Bronsiard's inequality. It's an optimizer. And perhaps even worse, you can take not C in the direction of A, but opposite to A and D opposite to B. Again, that would make it a very bad approximation. And yet it is an optimizer. So it really begs the question, why on earth they chose that measurement if, if their relation tells them, if they look at it, that it's really not suitable to, as a guide to find optimal joint approximations. But 
to end on a positive note, it's a lucky coincidence that the optimizers overlap enough so that the experiments that have been done to confirm Rancière's inequality, to test it and confirm it, also confirm our relation. So to summarize, I've shown you how Heisenberg's spirit materializes in rigorous formulations of measurement error relations. There's in addition an unsharp relation, this relation for compatible approximators. And just to show you the corresponding result for position and momentum using the Wasserstein distance, one gets a very standard looking Heisenberg relation. Generic results are yet outstanding except in finite dimensional Hilbert spaces. There are results by Miyadera. And um, yeah, then the second point to make is it's important to be careful with the choice of error measures. There are those where one gets reasonable results and there are those where the results are not entirely convincing. So thanks for your attention. Uncertainty relations, typically you care about the eigenvalues because you're calculating the, the variation, whereas sort of modern quantum information theoretical point of view, you tend to forget about the eigenvalues and just look at the well, objectives. So how does this play out in what, in what you're doing? It's not exactly eigenvalue, of course, if you have unsharp observed yeah, that's how that was outcomes. Yeah, well, of course. But you must you be can. attaching values so that you can calculate. Uh, well, you can. You could also alternatively take entropic measures. Okay. Greater values don't matter. But in a way, whatever is convenient. And for measuring differences between two probability distributions, say in position space, it can be helpful to know how far they are apart from each other and take that as sort of weighting into the degree of the differences. And if you do that, then you get um, error relations that pretty much look like our standard, uh, analogous to our standard preparation relations. So there are choices to be made and you can, I'm open to trying out when it's not in the center. Yes? Okay, non-technical question. In the beginning where you uh, had three pictures, you took that and Heisenberg, who was the guy in the top left corner? It was the guy who invented root mean square errors. What was his name? Gauss. <laughs> <laughs> Did I not say that? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Okay, any other questions? Yes? So, there seem to be two slightly different um, sort of meanings to joint measure. And as far as I can tell, you're conflating the two. So, I just wanted to check whether that was correct. Because this, this joint measurement um, sort of at a single time, as it were, and then there's also repeated measurement. And so the first one... What do you mean by repeated? Well, like measuring position, then momentum, then position again. Okay. And so the first one you'd be dealing with errors in joint measurement and measurability, and the second one you'd be dealing with disturbance errors. And from what I was getting that you were treating those as essentially the same thing, is that correct or did I misunderstand? Um, that's exactly right, that's how I read it. Sequential measurements are a way of defining a particular kind of joint measurements in our, in our view. So there's, there's no clear water between those in terms of what we've done? Well, in order to talk about errors, you have to do measurements in sequence, so that's a, a rather specific situation. Okay, so, so all of the joint measurements are in fact sequential measurements, is that? Uh, not necessarily. We have schemes where model schemes where you apply to probes simultaneously to the object. And then you could say, well, if these probes a priori have to be already approximate measurements, but if you combine them, then typically the errors get larger. And that is already a mutual disturbance. So you have the phenomen phenomenon of disturbance also present in simultaneous measurements. Because that, that seems to be a very different it seems to be it's it's combining, if you like, the statistics. So it's almost a, a post-processing plot, a joint classical error on the outcomes. Whereas with some, with repeated um, measurements, you can talk in terms of a disturbance on the state on the quantum state. So I'm just questioning whether those two really are enough. Relevant 
be similar, that there's not anything else going on. Throw that out and see if that brings any sense. In my mind, it all fits into one picture, but maybe we discussed that. Yeah.